here at the William Harvey. She's going to come and give you a presentation on proning. So over to you, Natalie. Thank you. Just to say, if I blind anyone with the laser in the front row, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I've never used anything like this before. Anyway, so proning goes in and out of fashion, as we know, and currently, hopefully, it's going to stay a little bit longer than it has with us. Um, guidelines were introduced in 2011, and this was because um, when referring to the tertiary centres for ECMO, we were getting to asked if we'd already decided to prone them and put them on APRV. So we thought, let's make guidelines to do that. So what I'm going to be talking about is a case study in particular um, that's been recent on the unit, the physiolo physiology of proning, literature reviews pros and cons. I'm kind of going to skip through that a little bit. Uh, our proning criteria and the complications related to proning. So recently, we've had a 49-year-old lady who I've named Sandra. Um, she was diagnosed with breast CA and had a mastectomy, which was uncomplicated at the time and was later sent home. She was at home for about a week and became quite short of breath um, and high temperatures. Came into A&E where the surgeons reviewed her and aspirated her mastectomy wound and later she needed a vac. While on the uh, ward, she deteriorated, she deteriorated and required um, some non-invasive ventilation, CPAP, and it was found she was in type 2 respiratory failure. She came onto the ITU with a sort of a raging kind of sepsis and a nasty looking pneumonia and that was at 6.30. She was maintained on CPAP within the unit, but it got to about two o'clock and she required intubation due to having really low SATs of about 60. This was her blood gas on the admission to the ITU. So just don't really, we well, can all read blood gases, but just know it's the PF ratio here that was an issue. She was kind of bordering into severe ARDS which we were quite worried about. And this is her chest x-ray before intubation. What do you guys see in that? I see some faces. <laughs> Anyone? Exactly. Typical artsy type picture. So, like I said, she deteriorated, uh, required an emergency intubation at two, for which we placed her onto APRV. Doing so, we noticed that it was, she wasn't moving on her high oxygen requirements. We did a long recruitment manoeuvre, which really didn't do a great deal, and it was decided that we needed to prone her. This here, again, Blood gases, we can all read them. This is the pre-prone. We note that actually she is now in severe ARDS. And while in the prone position, the uh, PF ratio came up. And this was her um, x-ray when we moved her back into supine after 16 hours of proning. We only proned her the once. What can you see there? So the lungs now re-recruited. Re this lady made a full recovery and uh, went home. Obviously, the uh, time that she spent in the ITU was 25 days, 22 of which she was still on the ventilator. Um, but she went home and actually, uh, a couple of weeks ago, she walked into the unit and I walked past her and didn't recognize her and until she said, uh, she called out my name and. I just, yeah, it was amazing to see her actually walk out of there because we had some very sort of hairy moments when caring for her. So during her stay, she had chest physio twice a day. She, we were following the ARDSnet protocol, uh, lung protective ventilation, low plateau pressures, and she had APRV ventilation before the prone, during the prone, and a little bit after the prone where we actually weaned and we did the drop in stretch. We had her on a trackie, we weaned her off of that and like I said, she went home and made a full recovery. We audit all of our patients who require proning and since February 2016, obviously, we've uh, had eight patients that have required it, that have been ventilated on APRV, that have all been referred to St Thomas's for um, ECMO, but none of which needed that. 
And in that audit, only one patient died, but that was due to other complications <laughs> rather that was related, that wasn't related to pronoon or APRV. So understanding anatomy and physiology, you, we're all well aware of where the lungs sit. We know that the ventral regions are at the front and the dorsal, which are the dependent lung regions, lie at the back. During ARDS, you get, obviously, edema. You get lots of wet sort of tissue in the lungs, which um, then you get added pressure as well as you've got the... Um, you've got an edematous heart as well, so it causes atelectasis in terms of when the patient is supine, the heavy heart is lying on the dependent parts of the lungs. There's gas squeezing and there's obviously a VQ mismatch. So here we go. This just shows when the patient's in supine, the ventral um, parts of the lung are able to inflate, whereas the dorsal parts, which are the dependent parts, can't actually inflate, oh, can't actually inflate fully. Whereas if the patient is in prone, actually the dorsal parts are able to ventilate, are able to get gas exchange in, as well as the ventral. Supine position, the problem with this, again, abdominal contents uh, moving up, causing pressure in the thoracic cavity. Uh, position of the heart, obviously supine, if it's a wet, heavy heart, it's going to be sitting on the lungs. Alveoli ventilation will be um, diminished and obviously reduced cardiac output. Whereas with prone, you've got the reduced pressure on the lungs, meaning that the heart is sitting on the sternum. Um, so that just says it really. Fluid shift, an improvement in VQ mismatch, pulmonary perfusion is redistributed to the dependent parts of the lungs, and there is improved secretion clearance. It's just nice CT. There you go supine and prone. So what the research says, I'm not really going to go over too much of what the research says. We know that the Gattinoni trial previously, the Guerin trial, the Fernandez, also suggests that proning wasn't very good. Oh, wrong way. <laughs> so the Gattinoni trial, just briefly, if you notice here, this is not somebody who's in severe ARDS. The tidal volumes were not um, lung protective, and the patients were only prone for six hours a day. Not very good, in my opinion. Again, with the Guerin, uh, lung protective wasn't met. They were only prone for seven hours, and they didn't meet the severe odds category. Again, with this one, and this one, and this one. <laughs> so what actually suggests is, the meta-analysis actually suggested that there was a subgroup of people who were in severe odds who were actually benefiting from proning, which takes us on to the Perceiver trial, again by Guerin. He took 466 patients with this early severe odds, which is what Sandra fell into. They proned them for 16 hours a day and stopped when the PF ratio came above, um, well, that's about 20 kilopascals. Uh, the peak <coughs> above below 10 and the oxygenation had obviously, de the requirements had decreased. So early intervention within 36 hours with 12, 24 hours of stabilisation period and longer proning times saw a better result. Again, going back to when the Gemma's slide with the ICU, uh, with the guidance for the provision of ICU services, um, everyone who is mechanically ventilated with an ARDS type picture should receive lung protective ventilation. They should be receiving proning for at least 12 hours, and ours are currently receiving it for about 16, 17 hours. But saying that, it all depends on unit safety, members of staff, and if there is um, a consultant on board to take the airway or somebody who is very well airway trained. The rescue pathway, which again is something that Gemma spoke about, which is the hypoxic pathway, we should all have a plan as to how to deal with these patients, and early tertiary referrals in terms of you may have proned your patient in the last two hours, you may have them on APRV, but refer to the tertiary centre because time with these patients is vital. Uh, oh, have I gone the right way? I don't know. Okay, when to prone. Follow your hypoxic pathway, which is what we do on the ITU. If the PV tool shows a non-recruitable lung or you can't get the oxygen requirement down despite being on APRV, prone. Um, and introducing guidelines into practice. Obviously, these have all been touched upon earlier on today. 
Um, and if the pa patient matches the criteria, consider for referral to early uh, advanced ventilation, which is the ECMO with the tertiary centres. Preparation, obviously you're going to see a video shortly, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but obviously you need to be prepared and it is a bit of a hairy procedure. Um, anaesthetist to manage the airway, four nurses, HCA, physios, whatever to assist with the term. You need three pillows, one extra sheet. Pre-oxygenate the patient to 100, or with 100% if you can do that. Um, aspirate the NG tube, uh, have spare ECG dots in the vicinity, um, management of lines and infusion. Take anything off that doesn't need to be on or that can be managed with boluses. After you've proned, bed tilt at 30 degrees, head upwards, obviously. NG feed commence when patient is proned, two to four hourly position changes. So when you do get someone into prone, you want to do the swimmer's position. So arm up, arm down, head facing, the arm up. They remain in prone position for up to 16 or 17 hours a day and to repeat this until the gas exchange ventilation settings have improved. So you can prone, get them back into supine, then you notice during the day actually maybe they need to be proned again. You can do that. But in Sandra's case, we only needed to prone her once. Complications of proning, I think they really speak for themselves. You're not always going to um, avoid facial edema. But where pressure area damage is concerned, what we found on our unit is the main areas of pressure damage we were finding were from the tube and the uh, securement devices. So what we found is using um, elastoplast, we were reducing the numbers of pressure area damage around the mouth and on the face. And obviously brachial plexus injury. Contraindications to prone, obviously pa facial pelvic fractures, no go. Pregnancy, no go. And if patients are DNR, it's a rescue method. If you're not gonna rescue the patient with CPR, should you be rescuing them with proning, you're just putting them at risk. And in conclusion, evidence may suggest proning benefits severe ARDS patients, identify the patients where benefits outweigh the risks, and staff training and education to safely prone is obviously really important, and that's why you're all here today.